Welcome to the Twinkle Talks EYFS podcast. Working in the early years is busy, funny, messy and exhausting. Join me, Shana, and the rest of the Twinkle EYFS team as we talk honestly about our experiences as practitioners, teachers and professional nappy changers. Whether you're listening to increase your CPD hours or catching up on our antics whilst driving home from work, Twinkle EYFS will share everything you need to know about all things early years. Hello and welcome to another episode of Twinkle Talks EYFS. I'm Shana and I'm really excited to introduce to you our first ever mini series. So the next couple of episodes are going to be based around a similar theme and I'll tell you more about that in a minute after we take a look at what's going on in your settings. Here's Katie with the latest news from Only in the EYFS. This week in Only in the EYFS. Jeanette Croft asked a child, how do you feel today? And they replied, full of gas. We've all been there, buddy. Amy Campbell has been accused of inappropriate work conditions when helping a three-year-old learn to ride a trike. They said, I can't do it. How can I work in such conditions? Looks like Hey Doug is in charge of your HR department. Susan Robinson was recently confronted by a child in her class asking, why was my poop green? It's normally orange. Neither options are good, buddy. That's it for this episode. Tune in next time for more antics in only in the EYFS. Okay, great. Thank you for the update. I hope everyone is um, doing well. That's all I can say about that. But today's episode is starting off something really special, something I've been working on for a really long time and I'm really, really, really proud of. The next couple of episodes, including this one, is going to be part of a mini series called Twinkle Talks EYFS Around the World. And this is basically stemmed from when I have been a teacher, but also when I've been talking to colleagues and other teachers, I've always wondered what it was like in other countries, how early years works, you know, what the curriculum looks like, what settings look like. And, you know, at one point I did want to go and work abroad in, in another country. So I thought, I bet there's loads of other early years practitioners that want to find that out too. Now, of course, we can't all afford to go and pop on a plane and go to whatever country and find out what it is. So I thought, why don't I bring them to you? So I've got an amazing lineup of wonderful guests that have volunteered their time to talk to us about what it's like to teach early years in their respective country. We have got guests from Mexico, Romania... South Africa, so many. But today I'm going to introduce you to a wonderful lady called Stacey and she's going to tell us all about what it's like to teach early years in Australia. Let's go and take a listen. Hi Stacey, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening, can I just say. For me it's the morning, it's about like half nine in the morning, I'm just starting my work day. You're at the end of your day because of the time difference in Australia, aren't you? So thank you for taking that time. Um, Why don't you introduce yourself to our lovely listeners about who you are, how you got into education and what your role is at Twinkle. Thank you for having me Shana. I am the segment manager and product owner for the EYLF segment in Australia. Um, So that's our early years before primary schooling in Australia. I got into early childhood education about 15 years ago. My daughter was running a centre and their cook went on holidays and I had been the school canteen coordinator moons ago and she asked me if I still had my food health and safety certificate and I said yes. And She said, can you come and be our cook? (laughs) That's how I started. And I was only relieving the cook who was on holidays and then they asked me to stay and take on the position. And then about two months later, they asked me to take on a traineeship, which is like learning on the job, getting qualified. So I started that way. And about three months later, I was the room leader of the preschool room. Wow. Did that for many years. And then I became a centre manager and I think I've had every job in the centre. (laughs) 
like, right? I feel like that's all of us. No matter what country we're in, it's like we've been the cook, we've been the cleaner, we've been the room leader, we've been like all of it. It's just one of those jobs, isn't it? Where it's like yeah. you muck in and do all of it. You muck in. Um, now, before we even move on, I have to be really aware. So, so Stacey, you have to like be open and just say, Shana, what are you on about? Because we have different like titles and abbreviations. I've already picked up on one that you've just said, E-Y-L-F. Now that's probably our version of E-Y-F-S. Yes. So if I say, EYFS I mean early years foundation stage which is birth to five what we're doing so tell our listeners what does EYLF mean (laughs) early years learning framework perfect most people call us early childhood or early childhood early learning yeah but early years learning framework which is referring to our learning framework that we're governed by yeah okay great so EYFS, EYLF, same thing, just in different countries. See, I'm yeah. learning so much already. Look at this. Yeah, it's just one little, it's different. <laughs> EYF. Oh, yeah, it is. It is. Oh, do you know what? Don't get me started. It's too early in the morning, Stacey. I can't. I can't work that out. <laughs> but you touched on something which I thought was really um, interesting about how you got into being a, an early years educator because there are loads of different pathways over here. Uh, you might do your levels in college and do NVQs and childcare. Um, a couple of my friends, they did a B.Ed., which is a Bachelor's Honour in Education, which is a three-year course at university. I did something different. I did something called Schools Direct, where after I did three years of learning at university in a completely different subject, I did linguistics at university for three years. But then after that, I did a postgraduate course in training, which is where I was literally thrown into a classroom for three days a week two days I was at university for a whole year and I gradually built up my hours and that's how I trained to be a teacher so there's a couple of different pathways how does it work in Australia how do you become an early years educator there are so many pathways the main one is people will come out of high school so end of the HSC so they're sort of 17 18 years of age yeah and they'll take on a traineeship which means they get paid very little money and they work five days a week in the service or the centre and they do their studying at home. They're supposed to get study time off the floor to study. Um, That's the main way and they get a certificate three in early childhood education and care and then you go on after that and get your diploma in early childhood education and care. The other way is that they can start that process in the last year or two of high school and they do it through a VTET, so like TAFE, which is like a, like a uni but not a uni. And then the other way is you can go to university and get a qualification in teaching, which is the Bachelor of Early Childhood Education. Yeah, okay, so like PGCE like we have. They get paid more money than an educator. Right. So a certificate and a diploma are called educators, and the one that goes to university and does the bachelor gets a degree is called a teacher. Right, got it. So it's actually quite similar to how we do it in England, like like you say, the apprenticeships, the you know the student teaching. Okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So I've got so many questions about what it's like in Australia. I know a lot of our listeners, especially ones who maybe are looking to teach in another country um, and go somewhere and experience it, or maybe they're going to go traveling for a year and maybe want to do supply work in Australia and things like that. There's going to be so many questions, but I suppose the big one is about curriculum, isn't it? Because that's kind of the main thing that guides us into how we teach. So before this episode, we sent each other each other's curriculum, didn't we? I sent you the English one, the many, many, many documents are England, and you sent me the Australian one. But you tell us, tell us kind of overall what the curriculum for early years looks like in Australia. We have the early years learning framework. That framework consists of seven national quality standards and each standard has between two and about seven elements and that is what a service has to abide by to be rated because each of our centers or our services are rated by a CEQA and the Department of Education. Mm-hmm. So a CEQA is the Australian Childhood Education Quality Control, I can't even remember. That wow. Is. Um, yeah. <laughs> so they come out and they assess your service and give you a rating from working towards meeting, exceeding and excellent. Yeah. The higher your rating, supposedly the better your service. So to do that, you have to fit inside the national quality standards. You have to meet all of them to get an exceeding Otherwise, you're working towards or meeting. And inside of that, we have the belonging, becoming, being document, which has the learning outcomes for the children. Remember those things that we're actually here for, the children? <laughs> <laughs> so that we have five learning outcomes, which is identity is one, two is community, three is health and well-being, 
four is learning and five is language. In each of those outcomes, there's multiple elements as well. And we also have practices and principles that we are guided by and governed by. And each educator is meant to have their own pedagogy and theory that they are drawn to, aligned with, and that is supposed to be what guides their practice. Yeah, no, that was a lot of information. It's good. No, it's good. It's good. So I feel like your quality standards are the same as teaching standards in England. It's like you say, those areas that we as practitioners have to hit. And then we get, we've got Ofsted over here um, who, like you say, come in and make sure we're doing all the right things. So that makes sense. Your curriculum, I think, your belonging, being and becoming. Yeah. Have I got it the wrong way around? Being, oh, belonging, I don't know. becoming. I often get it the wrong way around. Too. Okay, the three B. Remember the three B. Belonging, <laughs> being, becoming. <laughs> oh my God, I got it right. Yes. Okay. That curriculum is massively different to what our curriculum looks like. So you say you've got five outcomes, and I wanted to get into those a little bit because we've got seven areas of learning, and they are massively different to what yours are. A big one, I'm just going to start right here. Two of our areas are literacy and maths, and that's not even included in the three Bs. Tell me why. Tell me why. I think in the early years, it's about focusing on building the child, not building their scholastic skills. And, and mm-hmm. at the same time, we do, right? So we're very much play-based, very much open-ended resource-based in Australia, but you can teach early math skills without actually having to teach maths, right? Right. <laughs> That's what this is why I love you know, it. I'm like, yes. Drawing shapes, coloring in shapes, counting as you're measuring and pouring, as you're serving yourself lunch and you're pouring yourself a cup of water. Math skills, capacity, is it full, empty, half full? That's math yeah. skills. And that's how we teach. We don't sit down and go one plus one plus two plus three. Right. We don't teach like that. And you know, for some children, that's the way they do learn. So we will do that. An example of that is I have a child who's on the autistic spectrum and he will sit down and he writes numbers all day long and he tries to come up with the biggest number that he can think of. And so sitting with him, I'm not going to teach him about math skills with pouring water. I'm going to teach him math skills with numbers. You know what I mean? Mm. It's about identifying the child's needs and interest and building on that. See, I find that so interesting because when you were listing the different outcomes one of them is just learning like that's an outcome like as a whole umbrella tell us more about that I find that fascinating so outcome four that's where your maths and your problem solving and your those sorts of learning skills are, are embedded in that outcome but it's more about everyday life skills like I said problem solving No point teaching a child how to do math if they can't problem solve how to tie their shoelaces, right? Right. That's how we're supposed to look at it in Australia, I should say. (laughs) There are some that don't and there are some that take it too far. You know, children need structure, right? Yeah. So outcome four is children are confident and involved learners. That is the title of the outcome. And it's about building a sense of security and soundness so that children are confident to experiment and explore and try new ideas. Isn't that wonderfully written? I just, I, that was beautiful. That was like poetry to me, Stacey. I know. It's just so wonderfully written. This document, when you are a teacher or an educator with a passion for teaching children and you read that document, it actually brings tears to your eyes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I felt emotional looking at it because like you say, outcome four was really important to me in terms of how it's written because I feel like in England it's very subject based you know Mm. so for example one of our learning areas is maths it's like you know being able to count to 10 being able to talk about time being able to do this this it's all about the outcome or the you know the bit at the end yeah in Australia I feel like it's the process yeah very process oriented yeah it's got words such as develop skills such as problem solving inquiry like you said experimentation researching in fact and that covers all areas doesn't it because you can do all those skills in maths in literacy in in history yeah in every (laughs) subject yeah and I feel like that's great for early years I can't I'm trying not to be biased here but I really like 
the curriculum and how it's worded. We don't even call it a curriculum. Well, this is it. You don't even, exactly. (laughs) I think there's a very different concept. And what I also noticed as well was that play-based is core. Yeah. Whereas in England, we are play-based, of course, but it's not really so much as written that formally in the curriculum. It's actually one of the practices that we are supposed to be guided by, play-based learning. Right. Yeah, exactly. So can you tell us more about why that is? Because play is so much fun and the child having fun will learn. Right. <laughs> That's how I see it. Can you come to the House of Lords? Can you just come to our government and just do like a little... But isn't that right? If if you're bored, are you learning? No. no. If you're if you're sitting there going, oh my God, this teacher needs to be quiet... <laughs> Are you learning? <laughs> no. Hands up who went to primary school and learnt. But that's what I experienced at primary school. Oh, my God, just shut up. <laughs> if any of Stacey's teachers are listening, we apologise. <laughs> Thank you so much for educating me. <laughs> but I think play-based also, it allows, it sees the child as being capable of governing their own learning. So a child that is investigated in play, they will discuss, you've seen it, Children in the in the role play area. Yes, they'll start off playing mums and dads because that's usually where we start, right? And then someone will become the pet dog, and and they'll have to yeah. learn how to feed it. And then someone's the baby, and they've got to work out how to change its nappy, and it just expands into this beautiful, imaginatively experimenting, investigating scenario where they're the principle of their own learning. And mm. any educator that interrupts that gets a stern look from me. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the thing as well. Like in England, we, again, we have all of that process as well and we love it and, you know, they're in the role play area, like you say. We're encouraged to step in. And interrupt their learning. Well, well, it depends who you ask. And then, like, see where you could take that like question them or you know uh, facilitate what makes makes us think that we know better than them why should we be telling them where to take it they can take we're not seeing them as capable of deciding and making their own choices so you're limiting choice you're limiting in my world if you say to a child hey you've got this beautiful scenario going with mums and dads who's going to be the grandpa you've just cut down all their choices for me you've said to those children your game's not good enough. I'm going to tell you how to make it better. Oh, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah. They may not know a grandparent. That child may not have had a grandparent in their life. Yeah, yeah. So they've got no idea what a grandparent is. Let them find out. And I do get that we have to scaffold, right? I honestly do get Yeah. How can a child know they want to learn about space if they don't know space exists? Good point. Right? Yeah, yeah. So you do have to introduce things. And, like, we're also child interest-based in Australia, right? One of the principles is. So that means we take their interests. So a child may come into school on Monday and say, I went to the zoo on the weekend. So, oh, would you like to talk about the zoo? Right? And we might end up doing a, a zoo project. But here's the thing. If you're a smart educator... You can be sitting at group time and go, hmm, I wonder if we should talk about flowers this week. Do you think we should talk about flowers? Nine times out of ten, the kids are going, to go, yes! Yeah. So you can introduce things without it being, I'm going to tell you how, if that makes sense. I like that. It does, it does. It's very, like you say, very child-led, very open and child-centred, isn't it? Because it's literally the inspiration, the direction comes from them I love that I love that yeah it does have to have guidance of course, exactly exactly and I think a lot of England settings whether they're private or state are definitely feeling empowered to follow that direction um, which is really exciting you know hopefully we're given a little bit more freedom to be like to follow the child which is what it's all about what we all want to do and who says the way that we want to teach is the right way well exactly this is it there's yeah there's so many different ways the way the child wants to learn is the right way I love it stick it on a t-shirt Stace That's, I should you could actually that. that is yeah, a you good marketing that. thing <laughs> <laughs> you'd make millions <laughs> But of course, there are some similarities between our uh, curriculums that they're not just like worlds apart. Of course, they're not. Um, For example, I think our prime areas in our curriculum, we have two levels. So we have our three prime areas and then our four specific areas. So our three prime areas are communication and language, physical development and personal, social and emotional development. And these are the three that I think are really similar to the Australian curriculum. 
because one of your outcomes is children are effective communicators, which is our communication language. Yep. And then where it differs a little bit, I feel like the personal, social and emotional area for us is is expanded on over three outcomes for you. So you've got identity, community and well-being. So they're kind of stretched out a bit more. And I think that's a really positive thing that, you know, we're halfway across the world, aren't we? But we both recognize how important personal, social and emotional development is. A child can't learn if they aren't socially and emotionally ready. Well, this is it. Have you ever tried to teach a child in a tantrum? Many times, <laughs> Stacey. You're not getting anywhere. <laughs> many, many a time. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, that's a head-beating concrete thing, you know. <laughs> yeah. Let's get the child socially and emotionally ready to learn. Right. And I think we forget as well, like, how much of a big transition it is to go from being in the home to then suddenly being put in a setting, a nursery, a reception, a school, wherever, with, you know, 30-odd other children, different adults, and it's a completely different world, and it's a massive change, isn't it? So if we don't get that first bit right... Yeah, exactly. This is one thing that bugs me about the curriculum, our framework, though, is that our services, our centres, are supposed to be home-like and represent the home environment, right? What home in the world has 30 children in it? You're preaching to the choir, babes. Three adults if they're over three. So in Australia, we have a ratio of one educator to four children in naught to two. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then two to three, it's one educator to five children. That's not a big gap. That's only one extra child, right? No. And a baby and a three-year-old are very different. When they turn three, it goes one to ten. <sighs> so tell me how their needs halved overnight. <laughs> Oh, don't. Do you know, it's not, it's really not that different over here because when I was in a nursery, right, our ratio, just me as the teacher and then two amazing nursery nurses, right, the ratio for me, one to 13. Yeah, I know it's your ratio. Just me with 13 three-year-olds trying to get them. Are you joking? But again, like you say, the the teacher-educator difference for you guys. No, it's the same ratio for a teacher or an educator. A diploma educator has the same ratio as a a bachelor to qualified teacher who has the same ratio as a certificate three. So the lowest rank to the highest rank, it's the same ratio. That's baffling. Yeah, it's a bit silly. I mean, I don't want to say anything, but maybe... So yeah, for me, it's one to 13. For my nursery nurses, it was one to eight. It's a difference with five children. That's a lot. <laughs> it is, it's half, right? It's nearly half. It's nearly half. And I'm like, oh my God, if I'm not in the room, then yeah, it's ratio one to eight. But if I'm there, oh no, it's one to 13. <laughs> Do you guys have ratios on qualified staff? No, that's a very good point. So if we have like student teachers or volunteers or apprentices, they are not included in the ratio. Our volunteers and student educators aren't included in ratio, but anyone who is qualified is under the same ratio. But we have to have 50% or more of our staff over the service have to be oh, yeah. qualified or more. Right. So, gosh, you get, you're, you're, you're testing me on, like, my government document knowledge now I because know. I know we've got something similar. It was only recently introduced, a couple. was it a couple of years ago? In nurseries, you didn't have to have a qualified practitioner, as in teacher. But now it's law that you must have. Is it level six or above? You know what? My listeners will write in and they'll correct me, which I'm totally fine with. I am not under the impression (laughs) that I know everything. This is a learning experience for me too. But I'm pretty sure that at some level, you have to have a qualified teacher, which is, I think, level six over here um, in a nursery. You can't have a nursery that's made up of maybe level threes or level solely. There has to be at least one. we We have to have a qualified teacher once we hit 30 children in the service, we have to have one. And then at 60, we have to have two. And over 60, we have to have three. And it goes up as the number oh, of children in the yeah. service increases. But we have to have 50% of our staff or more at least diploma qualified. Yeah. Do you know, I'm sure we've got something similar. One of my listeners will, will point will point me in the right direction. It'll be great. But yeah. yeah and that only came in here three, maybe four years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Seems like we're all like moving together. It doesn't matter, you know, what we're doing. It seems to be going in the similar direction. There's also one last thing that I've noticed about the learning curriculum. Ours are broken up into ages and stages. So we've got, well, it's actually changed now. Last year, we had a big reform of the of the curriculum and it used to be in smaller chunks. Now we've got a curriculum for birth to three 
as in zero to three, they've all got the same curriculum. Then they've got three to four. Don't even. Right. Don't. For me, I think where we had it before, it was different. It was birth to two, two to three, which I think Uh, was a lot easier. Because like you say, a lot can happen for a baby and a three-year-old. They're very different milestones for me. Very different. Language, physical. Exactly. Yeah. Especially like babies can't talk. Three-year-olds will hopefully be able to talk by that point. It's a massive communication is very different physical is very all of it yeah yeah but now for some reason they're all put together birth to three then it's three to four so about nursery age and then it's reception which is the year before formal schooling start yeah but it baffles me that it's called birth to three three to four and then reception it's changed the wording from ages to technically class it's a bit baffling for me Doing that sort of stuff in Australia, I remember too, so the year before school has just always been kindy or preschool or whatever, and now they're calling it all these weird names. I'm like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. 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 But in Australia, we have some centres will have a naught to one room and then a one to two, a three to four, yes. four to five. Yeah. Some centres will have a naught to two because that's where the ratio, they'll, like, they'll break it up yeah. per ratio. I worked in a service that had naught to two and two to five. That was hard work. Ooh, two to five. Yeah, we only had the two rooms, so that's how it was broken up. Yeah, yeah. We used to have to split ratios throughout the day because you can count ratio down, but you can't count ratio up. So, you know. Yes. We were always having to manage how many under threes we had in the room, but that was really tricky having the two to five. So naught to three would be so tricky. You've got running around, climbing and not moving babies. That's even dangerous. The cur- it's, it's the curriculum in terms of what the development milestones are. So our settings will still have a baby room, a preschool okay. room, a nursery room. So, the, our, you know, our settings still split the ratios and split the rooms if if they are able, which is another good point, because some, you know, some settings might not be able to split babies and toddlers it might be like you say a birth to two room but they're just working with what they got but this is kind of the curriculum the the milestone so they're working in birth to three and what also changed as well is we used to have working towards age related working at age related and exceeding age related now all we have is working towards and working at we're not allowed to say they're exceeding anymore. But then that also looks like on our assessment, say if you've got birth to three, right? If a baby is age related, great. So they're age related, birth to three. That's what you say. If you have a toddler who's two, who's not made their milestones, they are working towards birth to three. So on paper, it looks like the baby's, baby's- more advanced than the top. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. So it's a little bit of a crazy, but in yours... I haven't seen the breakdown of ages in the outcomes. Is that right? So our learning outcomes aren't really broken down into ages. But if you read the elements inside the learning outcomes, you can see where the ages are, if you know what I mean. Yeah. What I want to say about that assessment is two things. Why are we assessing children? It really breaks my heart to say that we are sitting there spending time working out whether a child can or can't do something and then assessing them on that. But we can't be honest about it because we're not allowed to say they're exceeding now. (laughs) And and the other part of that is now that you can't say that they're exceeding, why are we dumbing down the population? Right. Why are we not striving for exceeding? Why is this a thing that we can't strive to be exceeding in anything except the rating of our service? Sorry, we have to be exceeding in that. Yeah, yeah. It's like children aren't allowed to be great at anything anymore. I mean... I just feel like it's turned into a competition, exceeding, working towards all of that. Who's to say? Who's to say that we should be at a certain point in our age, in our lifetime? I mean, as all educators in early years, we know, don't we, that progress in academics or learning or development or whatever you want to call it is not linear, especially in those first zero to five years. It can happen overnight. Right. I mean, we all went to college, university, we did our qualifications, we we know this to be true. So why is our assessment not reflective of that? There are a few contradictions in our things like that as well. Like they say, you know, we're supposed to meet the child where they're at and, and development is not linear. But hey, assess them. Right. Here's your summary <laughs> assessment of that child. Yeah. And then the year before they go to school, we have to do these transition to school statements from the department. And I sit there and I put my teeth and go, 
oh, I hate these statements. They are so school-based. They're not asking me whether this child can toilet themselves or can this child need help toileting? Can this child feed themselves? Yeah. Can this child open their lunchbox? Does this child do well in social situations? They're asking me, what pencil group does this child have? They're asking me, you know, can the child count to 10? You know, does can the child uh, do a 12-piece a puzzle? And they're all important things, right? And they're things that I will have incorporated into my daily work with the child. But why are we assessing them? And look, I get it. I've spoken to many school teachers and I always go to the uh, meeting with the schools to see what they want from me for the next year because I was the preschool teacher. And they say, we want to know that the kid doesn't eat glue. <laughs> The kid can use scissors. Yeah. <laughs> the kid can toilet. But they want to know where the child needs help. But I'm not mm. allowed to put that in my summative assessment or my transition to school statements. I'm not allowed to talk about that. I've got to talk from a strengths-based perspective. So I can't say little Johnny has great difficulty sitting still in his chair and will often get up and wander the room and go over to the blocks and throw the blocks around. I can't say that. I have to say little Johnny enjoys construction <laughs> <laughs> well it seems like we've got uh, similar similar difficulties similar challenges um across the pond and so the teachers get these important oh little johnny's good at construction then they make little johnny and go she lied <laughs> she lied <laughs> Oh dear, so yes, yeah, it's, it's not that much different from over here, to be honest. Um, but did you, having a look at our curriculum, was there anything that came up for you that you were like, oh, or? A couple of big things stood out for me was the, the differences in the qualifications and the ratios to the children, which I thought, oh, I wonder why they do that. And it kind of made sense. But in Australia, the degree teachers get paid more than the certificates. So I'm thinking, okay, they must get paid less. That's why they have less responsibility. But in Australia, we basically have the same responsibility. So that was a big thing. But the biggest thing, and I went, that's it, I'm moving to England, is that you don't have to have evidence for your observations and assessment of learnings. Not anymore. That is the biggest bugbear of all educators in Australia. I mean, across the world, Stace. We're all moving. (laughs) (laughs) Book your tickets now. Now, I have to admit, that's very new. Again, in the reforms that was a new thing as well it's taking less focus on the documentation so you know like you say the weekly observations the learning journals the reporting the I mean of course we still have a way of doing that I mean you know your half terms you might um, look at the curriculum and, and, and have an idea and your planning reflects obviously where your children are at but there's bigger focus over here now on teacher knowledge there's definitely a shift in We trust you as educators to know where these children are. And that's been massive for us. And that's what I have always felt is missing in Australia. They don't trust me to take care of their children. They don't trust me to do the right thing to have their child prepared and ready. And I hate that terminology at the same, like the child shouldn't have to be prepared for anything the child just is. Yeah. But the reality is that we do have to prepare them somewhat for primary school the next year because it's so completely different to early years. Yeah, exactly. And we get as well, like there does definitely have to be a way of checking that we're doing our job and that we do yeah. know where the children yeah, absolutely. are. Absolutely. But before this reform, and I'm sure it's probably similar for you in Australia, the amount of paperwork was ridiculous. <laughs> right. And you were spending more time recording observations, writing reports, filling in their learning journeys. And it just took so much time away from the child. And it just felt like you were doing things because, oh, I haven't got an observation on Billy this week. I have to go and do... Like, it quick, was very... Let me take a photo. Quick, quick. Right. Out yeah. This month. Yeah. Exactly. And it just wasn't about the child. It's about ticking the boxes. Yep. And it has no bearing on being authentic or about the learning journey of the child. Exactly. So I feel that's a really positive move for us. It's just ticking that box so I don't get in trouble. Basically, yeah. Oh, Ofsted are come in. Oh, we need yeah. to make sure the learning yeah. journeys are up to date, basically. And in England, do you get time off the floor to do these observations beforehand? <laughs> Supposedly. Same in Australia. That's a joke. It's a common, yeah, it's a common joke. Yeah, 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 yeah. As as it. We're supposed to get two hours a week, no matter how many children really? you have. I had forty five children across the week that I programmed for two hours a week to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that was as as alongside your planning. That was alongside meeting with other practitioners, meeting uh-huh. with parents. Me- uh-huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and being with the children. Yeah. You know, that bit that we're actually there. And being with the children, <laughs> exactly. And it was like, you know, if your ratio was down or if someone was poorly, well, that was your time gone. It just got taken away from you. So we, same struggles over here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Same, same. It's so interesting. So most of my observations, what I reckon 99% of my observations and planning were done at home outside of our unpaid hours. Right, not paid. We were not paid for it. And this is our workload. I know I did it myself. All of my teacher friends did it in nurseries, reception. It doesn't even matter up to year six, secondary school. We are taking books home. We are taking learning journeys home. We are taking planning home, reports home, and we are doing it at home and we are not being paid for it. And that is not okay. It's not okay. So this reform of taking it away and being like, you know what, we trust you. You do not have to do this amount of documentation was really positive, I think, for the direction our English curriculum was going for early years, which was really lovely. It's going to be so much better for your educators' well-being. Massively. And you won't have the burnout. We have a huge burnout rate in Australia, and that's why. I used to spend my whole day Sunday in winter, in summer, sorry, and in winter Saturdays, planning and documenting you know and and that's and I'd often be doing it at night time as well after I'd gotten home from work and it's usually a 10 hour day at work exactly you know? yeah, yeah when I was sent a manager I was still taking home work mm-hmm. yeah 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 so that's been a massive maybe we've got some Australian um government people listening uh, we hopefully. could do a little <laughs> hopefully and if your educators aren't getting burnout and they're not flipping and leaving that means you're going to get better qualified, better quality, more experienced educators, which is going to make a huge impact to the children, the people that we're there for. Yeah, I think this is what it was all about, which is it's really nice to have that positive kind of direction for us. So we are we're proud of that bit. We're good. We should just get together. Let's just do a merge of Australian England and take the best of both. It'd be great. Yeah. But we've talked a lot about the curriculum. I want to know what a typical day looks like in your classrooms. What does it look like in, in Australia? So we have childcare centres or early learning centres and then we have preschools and they run a little bit differently. Some preschools are inside the early childhood centres and some are what we call standalone preschools. Most centres open between 6 and 7 a.m. and close between 6 and 7 p.m. So usually the morning you'll come together for family grouping, so that's everyone together, all age groups together, and then they'll split off to their ratio room sort of area. and then. Usually around nine o'clock ish, because that's when most people are sort of kind of the majority of people are there by then. We will sit down and start our day. There's often learning happening outside. We usually you're outside in the mornings, and there's learning happening out there. But you'll start our sort of formal learning. The more structured, yeah. Yeah, and it often starts with a welcome to country. Ooh. Would you like me to do my welcome to country from the centre that I used to work at? What does that mean? So welcome of country is acknowledging our Indigenous heritage and our Indigenous people. Wow. It's really special. I'll say it for you. Yeah, please. We put our hands on our hearts and we usually have a yarn stick, which is a stick that's painted or woven in Indigenous colours or Indigenous pattern. Put our hands on our heart and we say, we at Aussie Kindies Early Learning would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of our land. Here is the land. Here is the sky. Here we are having fun with our hearts combined. Together we stand hand in hand and pay our respects to our elders past and present. Oh my God, my heart just exploded. And the children all say it. Like it takes them a couple of weeks and they get it. And each room will have their own based around that. But if you go on the Twinkle website, you'll see there's lots of um, acknowledgements to countries in Australia, different wordings. It's about acknowledging the land, the earth, the sea, the air and the traditional custodians of our land. See, I think that's so beautiful, but also really important to acknowledge, like you say, the history of Australia and and all the people in it and the land in it. And I just think that's amazing. And then we'll pass the yarn stick around and they can say whatever they want to say. You have to be holding the yarn stick to talk and they all want to have the yarn stick and some of them just want to hold it and then pass it on. But, you know, they all get a chance. Um, And then we usually have our morning tea and the children self-serve and and it's progressive so not everybody does it at the same time. And then while that's happening, there'll be learning activities in the areas for them to go and engage with while we're supervising those and supervising morning tea. It's a bit of a chaotic time, meal time. but And then formal learning for want of a better expression for the preschoolers it usually involves doing a phonics program and I haven't found one yet that I like I've tried jolly phonics have you tried twinkle phonics 
Twinkle Phonics is the only one I like. Thank you. I, I mean, we're not biased or anything, but. No, seriously, <laughs> it's Australian accent first and it's Australian font second. Uh, sold. I've done Jolly Phonics. I've done Reading Eggs. And there's some one that I've done. And, and they're just they're inappropriate for EYLF and they aren't Australian based. So No, yeah, they're very English based, aren't they? And very English based. And that's why I love Twinkle Phonics. And I am pumping that out there to all my EYLF contacts, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, it's just so important you learn your own dialect, right? 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. No point talking about the Jolly Red Boss when we don't have <laughs> red buses and we don't say Jolly. <laughs> you know. to be fair we don't either I, don't, I mean it's moved on since then but I, I agree to be culturally aware no, yeah jolly. we don't <laughs> no no exactly we don't even use jolly anymore so yeah that's really important but that's just important and um so I think the twinkle phonics Australian version is fantastic and then you know there's usually not every child gets to do the school-based learning because In the room, there may be children who aren't going to school next year, so they'll be inside engaging in open-ended art, craft, puzzles, shape. I often have children involved in sensory activities. Mm. Um, I will grab out hammer and nails and wood, and they can hammer and nail into the wood. And it's amazing how you give child hammer and nail and wood what they will construct. I bet. Sometimes I just give them logs of wood and off-cuts of wood. My my son-in-law used to work in a lumberyard, so I used to get all these off-cuts of wood. Oh, wow. So I just bring them in and the kids, and they'd make gates, and they'd make one kid wanted to make a bed head. I'm like, I haven't got enough wood for that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> Oh, just amazing. See, their own learning, the governor of their own learning. It's just amazing what they come out with. And then he wanted to paint it and he made this beautiful gate. Oh, it was so spectacular. I love that. We also have indoor, outdoor. So some children will be indoor, some children will be outdoor. It's their choice. And the educators are to move with the flow of children. So if you're indoors and you see there's only four children, you'll sort of go and stand indoor, outdoor, or you'll encourage those four children to come outside and have a look at butterfly or whatever you find yeah right? so it's about moving with the children but we always have art craft we always have programming I have set a lot of sensory stuff going on so I might have the sensory tub out and I might have had some cooked spaghetti or water beef or rice I love using coloured rice for scooping and pouring and measuring and volume capacity those sorts of engagements and even just this like I like pouring it on children that are got a bit of a sensory processing thing I'll just pour it on the arms and their hands and things like that we have a fundamental movement program so that's teaching jumping skipping hopping the children talked me into playing this year a game called zombie tip hide and seek so it was a combination of hide and seek and tip but I had to be a zombie that was fun what's tip well you've got to run around you're the person in you've got to run around and tip the other person and they become the person in and they've got to run and tip. we call tag oh so zombie tag hide and seek I love it yeah so I had to count to 20 with my eyes closed and then I had to run around and tip everybody but as a zombie (laughs) so it was a very slow run very slow (laughs) oh my god I bet the kids loved that they loved it and then you know they'd take turns at being the zombie but I seem to be the zombie a lot most centers will have Gross motor climbing apparatuses. Some have what? Some are great and have water features. We used to have a water feature. Do floating down the water feature. So you know you're learning so much in that little time. Yeah, what floats, what doesn't massive. float, how fast it floats. Usually there's a gardening activity throughout the day. We've had most centres will have a gardening area. So whether you're growing your own or whatever, but we used to grow our own veggies and and different herbs and stuff. We used to have a resident blue tongue lizard, which you probably don't know what that is. I do not. So it's a lizard. They grow probably 60 to 80 centimetres long <gasps> and they have a long blue tongue. And what does it like come and steal all your food? It eats vegetable, but it is also a meat eater. Um, it will bite you. <laughs> the bite is non-venomous, but it, it's painful, but not for long. <laughs> You're saying it so casually and then there's me and my listeners like, what? <laughs> this is terrifying. Oh, they're not. They're beautiful. <laughs> the most we get is like a fox that like poops in the sandbox or something. <laughs> so you say fox and I go, oh my God, fox. Really? We don't have fox. Well, we do have foxes, but only because they got introduced from England. Oh, whoops, sorry. So they're not native to Australia. But you don't often see a fox in Australia. Very, look, I've lived here a long time and I have only seen probably three or four. 
Really? See, you know what? Actually, that, that this is going to lead on to one of our um, listener questions in a minute. So I'm intrigued to ask a little bit more about this later. But before we get into that, you've told us so much already. And I know we could sit here for hours and talk about it even more. But what is your favorite thing about working in early years in Australia? Oh, my favorite thing is the children. I'm a trauma-informed educator and an autism-informed educator. And I've got to say, that's my little passion. Mm. I love helping children who have been through trauma or are on the spectrum and are struggling just to do the day-to-day thing of being with people. And I love making them feel safe and loved so that they've got the space to learn. Oh, Stacey, I love it. I love it. Are you ready for these listener questions now? Sure. Do you have to deal with wild animals getting into the classrooms? Because for me, when I hear Australia, I hear camel spiders, okay? Biggest fear of my life. I hear snakes. I hear crocodiles. We don't have camel spiders. What? You don't? I thought you did. We have huntsmen and wolf spiders. We don't have camel spiders. What? Okay, well, they're just as bad. Like, tell me. They Do are you... just as big. Oh, stop. Have you had any intruders? Oh, my God. Lots. Hundreds. Oh, stop. Hundreds? Aren't they like as big as Even your face? In my house at home. Oh, stop. Oh, no. No, they're only as big as your hand. That's big enough, Stacey. The majority of them wouldn't even be that big. But they're furry and they're ugly and they're creepy and they're crawly. Oh, stop. What other animals have, like, you had to deal with? Oh, birds fly into the classroom a lot. Lizards come into the classroom a lot. See, I don't mind lizards. I think lizards are cute. Lizards are cute. Unless they're venomous. Are they, are they venomous? They don't have any venomous lizards. Oh, okay. When I say venom, they do have venom, but they're not, they're not going to kill you, venom. <laughs> Just maim you, venom. That's fine. <laughs> no, they, we don't have any venomous lizards in Australia. What about snakes? Oh, we have the world's, we have five of the world's top ten or something in Australia. How, how, okay, how can you possibly teach in a nursery with that information? It's not like you're walking down the street and, oh, my God, here comes a venomous snake. You know, that's not what happens. Oh, that's what's happening in my head. <laughs> No, that's not what happens. Like, you would be highly unlikely to see any snakes in the city. And if you do, there'd be more likely your carpet and diamond pythons, which are non-venomous. Once you go out into what we call rural Australia, so you get out of the cities and you start getting, like where I live in the central coast is an hour from Sydney, right, which is our capital. So an hour past. I have had, and I've lived there 20 eight years and I've had three snakes in my backyard four snakes in my backyard I had one the other day oh the other day yeah and I've only only one of them has been venomous okay so, that's yeah. still terrifying to me but okay you you look They're very not, calm about it don't fall out of the trees and land in your lap kind of thing you are go, you sure <laughs> you can go for a picnic and be sitting in the in a bush and you'd be unlucky to see a snake really yeah what about crocodiles well crocodiles are only up in the north end of Australia okay that's good information so if I saw a crocodile I'd only be at a zoo <laughs> got it okay that's good to know unless I went up north kangaroos again never seen a, croc- a kangaroo where I live my daughter lives in Port Macquarie which is four hours past Sydney and she has kangaroos in her front yard every night I mean that's a am- and they're harmless yeah but they've got a kick though haven't they yeah but you don't go near them you don't walk up and go hi kangaroo can I pat you because then you will get kicked <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Common sense is probably something I'm missing here. You know, we teach children not to go things that we don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> I must have missed that class when I was in nursery. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's, it's safer than I thought it was. Great. Okay. Oh, it's so safe here. Phew. This is from someone who I think would like to possibly look at moving from England to Australia. So what's the process like from moving from England to Australia? Is there anything that they need to do especially or is it just a... They'd have to have a visa. Yeah. I know there are some visas. The company that owns the centre will pay for the visa. It's called a scholarship visa or something. But I don't really know the answer to that question. I'm guessing it'd be the same for any... I don't know what qual- how your qualifications would even translate i know a lady i know is from egypt and she was had a mask but another lady from iran so there's two ladies i know from sort of the middle eastern countries and they had masters of education so like a master's degree in education but when they came here it only equated to a diploma no way yeah. that's a massive difference i think that happens a lot i have another friend who had a master's of 
she was a doctor, had a master's of medicine in Egypt, and she could only be a pharmacist in Australia. Wow. Yeah. Okay, well, that's good for our listeners to know. So if you are thinking about making the move from England to Australia, just go and have a look at the translation of qualifications. So you can go on a website called ACEQA, A-C-E-C-Q-A, and you can put your qualifications in and it will convert it. Brilliant. Good to know. Thank you. And last question. I think it has to be my favourite one. What is it like celebrating Christmas in the summertime? Because I just can't picture it. Hot. <laughs> but, but isn't that, I just, is it great? Like, do you have barbecues and just, like, go swimming yep. and have ice creams on Christmas yep. Day? Like, I can't. So what's a Christmas meal? Depends. Some families are still traditional. Like, my grandma still has traditional Christmas of the hot roast chicken and the hot roast <gasps> pork and the hot roast beef and roast veggies. And you're sitting there fanning yourself, sweating. Like, you know, let's have more hot food. <laughs> yeah, like 40 degree heat with a roast dinner, yeah. Um, you know, meanwhile, the trifle's melting and sliding off the plate. And... <laughs> <laughs> but... Most modernish families, like my family, we will still have a roast turkey, but only a small little one, and we'll still have a roast pork, but only a small little one. But we'll have salads. We have an Asian salad, crunchy noodle salad. We'll have a um, pumpkin and bean salad, prawns, oysters. Oh, stop! You want to hear something even better? Yeah, go on. An oyster with cheese and bacon wrapped around the side. Put on a barbecue until the cheese melts and the barbecue and the bacon cooks. Oh yeah! Oh, it's a stop. thing. It's a oh thing. Oh my god! I really want to try it. Uh, what else do we have? We have trifle. We have pavlova. We have. I am now going to do a caramel milk chocolate rocky road that my stepmother made for me the other day. Yes, I know. C- can I book a ticket and come over? <laughs> It was seriously the best thing I've had in my mouth for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Australian grub is just amazing. I adore it. Like anyway, it's better than Brussels sprouts. Let's just say that. I like Brussels sprouts. No, you don't, I Stacey. Do. Butter and salt and pepper. Yummo. Oh no! I mean, I can tolerate it with some like pancetta and parmesan, but that's Ooh, very <laughs> Brussels sprouts and parmesan. Yeah. Oh, it's you might honestly, it's amazing. Brussels sprouts, pancetta, parmesan is the dish. I will try that. But stick it on your Barbie and let me know what you how, how you think of it. It'd be great. I will. <laughs> and this moves us on to our final part of the interview. All right. It's a teacher, would you rather? But we're gonna make it Australian edition, okay, just for you. But it's obviously gonna be a lot of food related in here because Australian food is great. <laughs> So I'll start with the first one, which is always the same, Stacey. Would you rather tea or coffee? Tea. I hate the smell of coffee. Never tasted it. Um, do you like like just breakfast tea or like fruit teas or? I love herbal teas, herbal green teas to, to be even more precise. The tea I'm drinking at the moment is called Calming Blend, and it has lavender, rose, chamomile, spearmint, and green tea. Yum. Oh, wow. See, I love my teas. I love herbal teas, but once there's, like, flowers in it, it's a bit weird for me. Well, if I drink too much of it, I actually do pee pink the next day because of the rose. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. you got rose pee. I love it. <laughs> it doesn't smell like it, though. <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, you know, it's like eating asparagus. We get it. We get it. Now, this is definitely an Australian question. I love this. Would you rather come across an eastern brown or a red belly black snake? I mean, choices. Well, I have a pet snake, so I'm not frightened (gasps) of snakes. I have a pet python, so non-venomous. What's what's their name? His name is Monty Python. Get it? (laughs) Hey! (laughs) That's brilliant. (laughs) He's only 1.2 metres long, so he's not big. And he's probably... Only? He's probably as thick as two fingers. Okay. He's not a big snake. But he comes out and he spends the evening with me in summer and crawls around my head and my shoulders and around my lap and sometimes gets stuck down my lounge. You're just living your Britney Spears life is what you're doing. My Britney Spears life? You don't know that where she has the snake on her shoulders, oh, isn't it? okay. The snake charmy bit. <laughs> 
I'm not a snake charmer, but I do go and catch snakes when my friends have snakes that come into their houses. As long as they're not venomous. If they're venomous, I won't play the game. That's not my game. No. So I love Eastern Browns because they're the second deadliest snake in the world and they are aggressive and they are don't with me snakes. I mean, there's so much to love, clearly. Yes, they are. And the red belly black snake is beautiful. It's sheer black with a red to orange underbelly, and it's just so pretty. But again, it can be an aggressive snake, and it is highly venomous. What a decision. Um, Which one would I prefer? Look, in my bed, neither. (laughs) In my house, neither. In my backyard, I'm going to go the Eastern Brown just because they're the second deadliest snake in the world, you know. Got to live up to that rep. I mean, yeah, cool. I'll I'll go with that. That's fine. M- rather me, rather you than me, lovely, but that's, that's cool with me. Okay, last one. This is a proper Australian food one. I love this. Would you rather a lamington or a pavlova? Oh, pavy. Pav. Oh, really? Can you explain what's, what's a lamington? A lamington is a sponge cake that's been dipped in chocolate and then rolled in coconut. It is yummy. Ooh. It is yummy. Super. And sometimes they split them in half and put jam in the middle or cream in the middle, and that's yummy too. But a pavlova, you know, you know what a pavlova is, yeah? Well, I a pavlova is my favourite dessert of, of life. But it's got to have fresh cream on it. It's got to have passion fruit on it. It's got to have blueberries on it. It's got to have strawberries mm. on it. Even better, you get some meringues and you crush them up and then you sprinkle meringues over the top of all that. Yes. Yeah. Chocolate, great chocolate over the top of it. I mean, all of the above. Yeah, just have it all. All right. I mean, it's Christmas. (laughs) Why not? (laughs) Oh, Stacey, this has been so fun. I feel like I've learned so much about the life in Australia. And I feel like I'm not as scared. No, I'm lying. I'm still terrified of the snakes, but... Your confidence and love of them makes me feel better. So if I ever do go over, I'll just make sure to come to your house because I know I'll be safe. You can come to my house and you can pet my pet snake. (laughs) I wish I was brave enough. That sounds so cool. And if you get super brave, we'll even put him across your shoulders. No. no. He goes across my shoulders and then he comes up the side of my face and he flickers his tongue out and kisses me. Oh, that's cute. Monty sounds cute. Monty is cute. Okay. Um, Just like a puppy dog, but not fluffy. Well, mm, yeah, they're so similar. And I only have to feed him every 10 days or so in summertime and in wintertime only every two or three months and I only have to clean his cage out every six weeks or so. But what do you feed him? In Australia, it's against the law to feed live animals. Okay, phew. He gets a frozen rat, a hopper rat, which is a juvenile rat. Okay, okay, that's slightly better. You can feed mice or quails, but they all have to be frozen. Then you have to defrost it so it's warm because he's a heat seeker. Boil your kettle and stick him in hot water for a little bit and then dry it off and then go get your tongs and wiggle it in front of your snake and then he's... (laughs) (laughs) It sounds exciting and terrifying at the same time. (sighs) I bet all the Australians listening to this is like, oh my God, Shana is such a wet wipe. (laughs) (laughs) Wet wipe. (laughs) Uh, that's what we say over here. If we're yeah, wet wipe, we're a wet wipe. If we're not very brave, have you got anything like that that you say? We'd call you a. P- okay. <laughs> I'm gonna have to edit that out because you can't say that over here. <laughs> a wet wipe is like a nappy wipe, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that's even ruder. You're calling me a. Then a. P- not as in a as in a cat. Oh, uh, mm, it means something very different over here. <laughs> it definitely means female body part. <laughs> It does here as well, but when we say it in that context, it means as in a cat because they're scaredy cats, see? Oh, yeah, don't, don't, don't call anyone that over here. You might, (laughs) you might get some violence. (laughs) Well, if I was in the pub and I said that to a bloke, then I might get in some trouble there as well. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's not something that we're allowed to say. Context is important in everything we say. In all things we say. (laughs) Oh, Stacey, this has been so much fun. Thank you for taking the time to educate me about early years in Australia. It has been amazing. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. I've had a great time, actually. It's a bit nerdy. But... <laughs> I'll catch you on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> Have a lovely day and I'll, uh, I'll see you soon. See you soon. Bye, England. Stacey is hilarious, right? I am so glad I got to chat to her. And honestly, there was a lot of editing that went on. We talked for ages. There was so much I could have put in. But 
it was so nice to chat to her and it was really interesting isn't it we've got loads of things in common and there are also some pros and cons to working in both countries so look if you want to find out more information and you're thinking of maybe taking a year out or even moving to Australia to go and teach in early years, I've put the links to Twinkle Australia's social platforms so you can go and ask. You can go and find out more information for yourself if that is something that you would really like to do. Perhaps this talk has inspired you to explore a bit, which would be super exciting. Or have you talked in Australia and have some other things that you want to tell me about it. I love hearing from you guys about your experiences and about what happens in your settings. And, you know, if you've taught in another country and you want to tell everyone about it, let me know. That would be super, super exciting. But that's it for today's episode. I'm so grateful to Stacey for giving up her time to come and talk to me and have a bit of a laugh. The next episode in this mini series is all about teaching in early years in Romania. And we did it as a TikTok live a couple of weeks ago. So this will be the recording of the TikTok live. Until then, I hope you have a great day and I'll see you very soon. So that's it from today's episode. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you really enjoyed it. If you would like to get involved or would like to know more, come and find us on our social media sites. We have a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest and TikTok account. All of the details will be in the description. And whatever you're doing, I hope you have a great day today.